Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. This is, this is quite a crowd. <laughs> it's like standing room only. Um, so thank you all for coming on such a nice night. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here tonight. Um, we do have a really good presentation that I think you're uh, really going to enjoy. So a um, couple housekeeping things and other things I need to talk about. Oh, I'm getting the sign from John over there. Is this loud enough? Talk louder? OK. John, change your hearing aid. Come on, man. <laughs> all right. So all right. Um, so first, um, I've got to recognize and thank the folks at, at, at our firm who really worked to put this on. I know they're all here somewhere, probably, so if they want to wave, if they're within earshot. Uh, Betsy Wolking, Jennifer Rourke, um, Jessica Holcomb, Grant Mosier, and of course, Allison, who's wandering around. So thanks to all of them for all their work. Uh, a little housekeeping. On your table, there's these little postcard size um, surveys. So if you want to take a moment at some point in the next hour and fill those out, that'd be great. Um, it does ask for your social security number, your, uh, your mother's maiden name, and your first pet. So uh, Jeff's giving me the no, don't, don't fill that out. So all right, you don't have to do that. Um, but do fill out the card. OK, um, just a little update on kind of what's been going on with us for the last year. It's been a really nice uh, 2014, certainly. Uh, we've been really blessed in a, a number of ways this year. First, uh, we've hired some, some really good people. We've added a couple really strong administrative people to an already awesome administrative team. Um, we've got Hallie Peters and Grant Mosier. If you haven't met those folks, they're really good, energetic, uh, hardworking folks. And the investment team has added three more people, uh, Brad Soper, Becky Gallagher, and Rachel Rasmussen. And uh, they, too, are young, smart, good employees. And plus, they've reduced our average age by about half. So <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. So, um, But really, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I just feel like really lucky to get to work with 31 other people that I just really like working with. And they're hard workers and nice people and couldn't ask for much more than that. So um, I know a lot of you share that and tell me that. So it, it's nice to hear that. It really is. Um, we've had a couple nice recognitions. Earlier this year, CNBC put out a list of their top 100 fee-only wealth managers in the country. And we made that list, which was really nice. So. We'll take it. Um, and then just a week ago, uh, Mark and I got to uh, go down and accept an award um, on behalf of the firm from the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. Uh, it was called their Bridge Builder Award. And they give it once a year to a professional firm in the area um, that has just, in their view, contributed to uh, working with them to improve our community. So that was really neat to get that award from a, a local group that um, I have a lot of respect for. Greater Cincinnati Foundation is a, is a really good outfit. So that was cool. Um, so <laughs> thanks. And then finally, uh, I mean, we're just blessed with great clients. We really are. Um, I know I've, I've said that before when I've been up here, but it's true. It makes such a big difference uh, in our daily work to work with people that nice people that we enjoy, that we have a mutual respect, and, and we care about what happens to them. So uh, thank you, really, for just being great clients. So appreciate that. OK. Um, well, let's get on with the, the, the real program here. Um, but first, I do want to introduce Greg Bruce before I introduce our speaker, Jeff. Uh, Greg is here from Schwab. Here's Greg. Thank you. Greg is like the, the regional rep, um, but it's important for him to be here because a significant portion of all of your assets are with Schwab, and uh, they really take security seriously. We know that. We see it every day in, in working with them, and uh, that's really important to us and I presume to you. So uh, 
Greg, thanks for being here. So, all right, on to the main topic. Uh, our speaker tonight, our presenter, is uh, Jeff Lanza. Um, Jeff is a highly sought after speaker, consultant, author, and, and also to make him feel at home, I know he's from Kansas City, so I had to bring the KC hat. Thank you. So it's very nice. Whoa. <laughs> Doug, is this like this would fit my son Doug. He's got like the largest head in the family, so you know, I won't wear that because I know I look pretty silly, but we'll leave that up here if it makes you feel better. So Thank you. Um, Thank you. And I am rooting for the Royals, by the way, to beat the Giants. So uh, Jeff is a retired FBI agent, twenty plus years, um, working on a lot of bad stuff, you know, corruption, fraud, organized crime, human trafficking, cyber crime. Um, so obviously tonight's topic uh, is one that's timely. He knows his stuff on this, and uh, I know he's going to put on a great, great presentation. So help me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. We really appreciate that. There you go. Thanks so much. Thanks for that nice introduction, and uh, thank you for that warm welcome. So the one thing I want to add that Dave did not say during my introduction, I think this is important to know. I live in Kansas City. I'm, I retired from the FBI about six years ago. I picked up a little hobby. I became a Kansas City certified barbecue judge. And a lot of people react that way. They say, well, that's a really cool job. You get to judge barbecue. And, but then you wonder, wait a minute, how does that connect with a law enforcement career? I think it connects really well. I'll prove it to you. I have a shirt that says on the front, retired FBI agent, certified barbecue judge. On the back it says, I can't tell you or I'll have to grill you. <laughs> now you're probably wondering, some of you, well, I hope he's not leading with his best stuff because this, this could be a long 60-minute program. All right, we've got to get right into it because we have a lot to cover. And uh, my topic today is not just identity theft. Really, it's about all the fraud that we're experiencing these days. And I've broken the topic down into five basic categories. We're going to talk about your information, your documents, some of the tricks we see online, how to protect your communication both on the computer and a little bit about your phone communication as well, those smartphones that we carry around with us. And then something about how to keep crooks out of our lives in, in a lot of other different respects as well. So I'll start off with, uh, with uh, about, I should mention these handouts too. These, you should have two handouts. Uh, they, are, they are copied or printed back to back. Uh, these are handouts, of course, for you to take home. You don't need those to follow through the presentation. Those are just a permanent resource to you. And if you would like to get an electronic copy of those handouts, I'm sure the folks at Foster and Motley will provide that to you. Or you go to my website, which is listed on the screen, and on the handout, where you can get an electronic copy. And you can pass those along to friends, colleagues, relatives, anyone you think would benefit from that, inf that information. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is a picture of the Apollo guidance computer system that got us to the moon seven times. And, and if you count Apollo 13, it got us there seven times, and it weighs, as you can see, you know, uh, four, uh, 70 pounds and was four cubic feet in, in, in dimension. Now, if you look at the average phone that we're carrying today, we'll take the iPhone 6, for example. The iPhone 6 is, is much smaller than that, of course. It's four cubic inches and weighs only five ounces, yet it has three million times the processing speed than the computer that got us to the moon seven times, and 32 million times the memory than what got us to the moon. Uh, several times. And you can see in, in this age of electronics, this miniaturization of electronics has created uh, a, a, you know, a lot of advantages for us. It makes us more productive. It makes, us, uh, it makes us able to do many things we can never do without it. But yet it also created, uh, creates vulnerability. So we'll talk about some of that too when it comes to computers and phones. It has also created a generation gap and, uh, between the people that use these that are much younger and the people that use these like me who have had to immigrate into the world of electronics. In fact, it may, it may have created images like this in, in your family when you see this occur uh, between members of your own family. <laughs> now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I consider myself a digital immigrant. I've had to immigrate into this world of electronics. Where my kids, who are you know a teenager and just 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 uh, 21 now, they're natives. They 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 didn't have to immigrate. They 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 have got into this technology a lot easier than we have. So we're gonna we're gonna try and narrow this gap a little bit, at least when it comes to security as well as well tonight. So uh, let's get right into it. I want to talk first about some of the credit card breaches that we had because people always ask me about the things that are going on in the world today. So we had the Target breach less than a year ago. We had Neiman Marcus point of sale systems breached as well. We had Michael's breach of the same thing, 
credit card processing equipment in the stores breached. Yahoo had email accounts stolen, 40 million email accounts stolen from their database, including usernames and passwords. And we're seeing so many breaches today. Home Depot, we thought, was the biggest breach, right, at 56 million credit, credit cards. And then now we learn more recently that we have JP Morgan, who lost 76 million records due to a hack. Now, when you have this type of breach, the JP Morgan specifically, that, that's a dangerous situation because that includes social security numbers. And that's the key to stealing your identity is for the bad guys to get your social security number. So we're going to cover that in just a couple of seconds. What, uh, what is even more amazing to me is this is a headline from USA Today a couple of days ago. 500 million records have been stolen in 12 months. So it's not just these other breaches that we've seen. It's, it's small businesses as well being breached and individuals getting information stolen from them as well. Now back to the credit card situation. A lot of people ask about this. The problem in the United States is with credit cards is we still use old-fashioned technology. We use the magnetic strip on credit cards, which, is, which has been not even used in Europe anymore. They've been using the magnetic, the, excuse me, the computer chips in credit cards for at least 10 years, maybe longer than that. And that would make our computer, our credit card processing a lot, a lot safer. Now, using the embedded chip in a credit card would not have stopped the target of the Home Depot breach but it will stop what could, they can do with the information, and that is take fake cards and embed that information that they stole from Target onto fake cards to be used. Now, the embedded chips are coming in the future. We'll see that in the next year or so. The merchants have to get the equipment. The banks have to give us the credit cards. But in the next year or so, because of Target, we're going to start seeing embedded computer chips in credit cards versus the magnetic strips, which has caused some of the problems today or made us more, more vulnerable. Okay, so with all that being said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right in. And by the way, with regard to those breaches, if you have uh, any issues with Home Depot or Target where you've used your credit card at those locations, it, it, it's not necessary that you get a new credit card, and maybe you've got one already. Just keep a really close eye on your credit card statements. And if you use debit cards at those locations, keep a close eye on your bank statements as well, which we should be doing anyway. So let's, uh, let's talk next about, uh, about a town, the town that I live in, Kansas City, Missouri. There is a... Uh, area of town called the Country Club Plaza. On one end of the Country Club Plaza, there's a Cheesecake Factory restaurant. There's a Starbucks about a tenth of a mile away. A lady who attended a presentation similar to this, after the presentation, about a day or two later, she called me up and she said, I had an event happen to me. I had the credit card taken out of my purse, which was taken out of, out of my wallet and my purse. The MasterCard was pulled right out when I wasn't looking. She didn't know it happened until the next day when MasterCard called her up and said, did you make a purchase of a $2,000 espresso machine last night? Now, she was not anywhere near Starbucks. She, she was in the Cheesecake Factory restaurant, so she was a tenth of a mile away, but she didn't make that purchase. And she realized what happened. Someone had bumped up against her and pulled out her credit card when she wasn't looking. Now, they took that charge off her bill. She's not going to have to pay for the cost of that. We all end up paying the cost of fraud eventually. But that's credit card fraud. That's not identity theft. Identity theft is a much more difficult problem to solve. That lasts a lot longer. Credit card fraud, they take the charge off your bill, and everything goes pretty much go back, goes back to normal. What's so interesting about this case, though, is the timeline. So now we know, after she got the phone call, that, that, that she, they stole the credit card at 9, 10 p.m., and then it takes about a minute to walk to Starbucks, and he made the purchase, we know, from the credit card records at 9, 16 p.m. And what's so, ama what's so amazing about this timeline is the crook only had to wait in line for five minutes at Starbucks. That's the most amazing part. If I try to put any humor into this presentation, and to the extent that you might think it's funny, it's not because I'm not deadly serious about the topic of fraud. Of course, fraud is a very, very serious, serious topic. OK, so identity theft is much different than credit card fraud. Identity theft is where they get your social, they open up new accounts. It could be credit card accounts. It might be loans. It could be checking accounts. They might file taxes in your name or request reimbursement for medical care that you didn't get in your name. And those could be long-lasting problems. The effect could linger for weeks, months, sometimes even years. And the key to keeping your identity safe, to not have this happen to you, is, of course, protecting your Social Security number. Now, your Social Security number is the key to stealing your identity. If, I didn't, if, they, if they don't have my social, they can't open an American Express card, for example. So I need the social to do that. No credit, no credit card company is going to give you a credit card unless they run a credit check. And you need the social to run the credit check. So Keeping your identity safe from, from financial fraud, from a financial identity theft, the key to that is, is protecting your social security number. So you already know you don't carry your social security card around with you. But what about your Medicare card? Or what about people in your family that are carrying around your Medicare card? That's your health insurance card, like my parents. This is their health insurance card. They carry it with them all the time. And on the Medicare card is printed your social security number. So if you lose your documents, if your purse or wallet gets stolen, 
then it puts you at risk of identity theft because now they have the social security number plus your birth date and your name and address from your driver's license. So if you think your social security number is at risk for any reason, uh, then the first thing you should do, there's two things you should do, and, uh, and, and that, if this gets lost, that's, th these are, I'm going to tell you two things to do right away. But this also pertains to people that may not be on Medicare. Let's say you get a letter from a company that says, we lost your social security number. It was on a laptop that was stolen out of a car. Or you were a client of J.P. Morgan, and we lost your social security number because the Russians hacked into our computers and stole it. So what do you do? Two things you need to do right away. And the first is to put a fraud alert on your credit reporting account. We all have credit accounts, credit reporting histories that are maintained at three credit reporting agencies. And on one of the handouts that you have, you'll see a list of all those agencies. And all you have to do is contact one of them and, they, and let them know that something has happened with your social security number and they will put this fraud alert on your account. That lasts for 90 days and you can renew it every 90 days and you can do that indefinitely. And that should prevent people from opening these new accounts in your name if they get your social security number. Now, in the state of Ohio, you can also freeze your credit. And if you're at the position in life where you never think you're going to need to apply for credit again, or maybe, maybe just minimally you'll have to do that in your life, consider freezing your credit. For senior citizens, it's free to do that. For others, it's $10 per credit reporting agency. But the bad guys can't open accounts in your name because they can't get access to your credit report because it's frozen. And you can still get access to it to open accounts yourself. You just have to unfreeze it. It's a little more cumbersome than a fraud alert but it is a, a sure way to protect your identity from being stolen for financial purposes. You can contact the credit reporting agencies that are listed on the form and just ask them about credit freezes as well, and they'll be able to do that, uh, do that for you here in the state of Ohio, as in any other state. Now, the second thing you need to do, besides the fraud alert or a credit freeze, is related to this problem, which is a huge problem today. It's where someone steals your information and they file tax returns in your name. So let's say I'm a crook and I get your social security number. About January 15th of any year, the IRS starts accepting, social, starts accepting tax returns for the previous year. So I file a tax return in your name with your social, with your name and address. And, and, and of course, I have a prepaid debit card or a check sent to me at another address. And I make up all the numbers and I might put in, uh, even include in the envelope uh, W-2s, which I print on my home computer all made up, everything's, everything's uh, fake, the numbers are not real, but the IRS will provide me with cash right away as, as, the, as, the, as the refund on the tax. Now, when you go to file your taxes in February or March or April, the IRS will reject your tax return because you only get to file one tax return per person and you've already filed one according to the IRS. But it's a crook who filed in ahead of you and now has stolen your identity to get a refund in your name, which creates a huge problem for you not only do you have your identity stolen, but now you've got to deal with the IRS. You're not going to get your refund, and it could cause you long-term problems in getting your, your refunds and your tax returns filed in the future. So there's an easy way to prevent this from happening. If you think your Social Security number is at risk for any reason, you can fill out this form, and this form is called an identity... Whoops, and I'm going to go back here. And it's called an identity theft affidavit, and you can get there very simply by just Googling that term, identity theft affidavit. Here's the form that comes up. Uh, the Google result, you click on the link there, you click on the, on the Google result, and this form will uh, then uh, be able to be downloaded by you and filled out and printed. You send that into the IRS, and the IRS will, will, will send to you, they will send to you a, uh, a PIN number, and that PIN number will be used to file taxes uh, for you in the future for that year. And so the bad guy theoretically doesn't have your PIN number because that's delivered to your home address. So you need it to file with TurboTax, you need it to file by, with, by paper, you need the PIN to file with your CPA as well. This PIN prevents identity theft refund fraud. And you only fill that out if you think you have a, you're at risk of identity theft due to, this, uh, to the someone getting your social security number. So those are the two things you need to do, a fraud alert or a, and an identity theft affidavit filed with the IRS if you think your social is at risk. Okay, let's talk about uh, the second thing on the, on, the, on the list here is protecting your documents. And we'll start off just a simple thing with your mail. If you have a mailbox like this, please don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. And you know what I mean. Don't mix pansies with salvia. They just don't go well together at all. <laughs> of course, what I'm talking about is the flag. When you put the flag up, that tells people you have outgoing mail to be picked up. And the bad guys may get your mail before the most post office picks it up. And that could lead to all sorts of problems, maybe identity theft. It could also lead to a more immediate problem than that and that's something called check washing. So let's just say I put a check in my mailbox using a, a pay, paying a bill. I'm paying 
uh, a cable company. And there's a picture of the check. I write it out with ballpoint ink. I put it in my mailbox to be picked up. The crooks come by and steal the envelope before the post office gets it. They take my check and they take, you can use bleach, you can use nail polish remover, and you wipe off that ink, you write the check out to yourself, any amount that you want, and then they're off and running. Check fraud, uh, check washing has been around for a long time, and it's easily preventable by not putting checks in your mailbox. Paying bills online is much more secure, and we'll talk about online security today as well. But also, when you do write out checks, take them down to the post office, don't leave them in your mailbox. And finally, when you do write out checks, don't use ballpoint ink, which sits on the surface of the check paper. That's really not as secure as gel pens. Black gel works better than blue gel. So get a pack of black gel pens at CVS, your local stationery store, and use that to write out your checks. Because the gel is a liquid in the, pa in the pen. When it comes out, it gets absorbed into the cotton fiber of the check paper. It's much more secure than ballpoint ink and you shouldn't put them in your mailbox anyway. So that's a double level of protection against check washing, that type of fraud that's still going on today as a quick source of cash for the crooks. Now, if I stole your mail, I could be arrested. Stealing your trash is not even a crime, which I'm gonna get to in a second. But while I'm on this point of, of, of statements and mail, it's a good idea also to sign up for electronic delivery of your statements. And you're, you know, coming in your statements coming in your email box uh, is much more secure excuse me, it's much more secure than getting them delivered uh, in your mailbox where they could be stolen and potentially used for fraud. So talk to Foster and Motley and your other accounts about signing up for electronic delivery of statements where you go to uh, your, your email box, you, uh, you're notified that a statement is available, you go to the website to download the statement. All right, now I started to talk about your trash. And your trash, if I went to your house and stole your trash, I haven't even committed a crime. However, if I use your trash for fraud, that's, of course, that's a crime. Uh, and you want to make sure the crooks don't go into your trash to use it for identity theft. In other words, they may steal your trash that includes anything more than your name and address because your name and address you can find anywhere. So you don't have to shred envelopes. You don't have to shred magazine covers. But anything that has more than that on it, you should shred. Account numbers, birth dates, obviously social security numbers, credit card offers, pre-approved credit card offers. Make sure you shred those. And, you don't, and when you shred these documents, make sure you do not use a strip cut shredder. They're really not secure. You want a diamond cut or cross cut shredder that will give you the documents as shredded in those tiny pieces that you see there. So cross cut shredder, diamond cut shredder, much more secure than a strip cut shredder. And I know what some of you might be thinking, how they're going to go in my trash and try to piece those back together. They don't even fall apart in the trash can. And you could take, you could take pictures of that, the bad guy could, and put it on, through a computer program and it'll reconstruct it automatically for him. So you want to use a cross cut or diamond cut shredder, not a strip cut shredder. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, I get all this stuff, but this isn't going to happen to me. No one's going to steal my mail. No one's going to steal my, my, my trash. A and who's going who's to you know, find these strips of paper? And by the way, back at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, they found strips of paper in 2012 Mac Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on the, on the streets of New York that had been shredded the wrong way by the New York City Police Department. And you could see on this strip of paper, there were many of these that had a detective's name on it, his rank, his badge number, his social security number, and his birth date was right on the strip of paper. So strip cut shredding, not secure. You want a cross cut, cross cut, or diamond cut shredder. Now, again, you might be thinking, this is not going to happen to me. Right? Never be in denial about crime, because I was with the FBI for 20 years, and whenever we had someone victimized by crime, in many cases they would say, I never thought it would happen to me. You know, I was only going into Starbucks for a minute, and I left my laptop in the car, and I didn't think it was going to happen. And, and it happens very quickly. The same thing with shredding documents, the same thing with your, with your mail. Protect them like we've talked about already. Whatever you do, just don't deny that crime can occur because then we let our guard down and we're not as vigilant. So to help illustrate that point, just a quick story from my personal life. We were, we were, we were over in uh, Santa Clara area in California where my son goes to school. He's a chemistry major at Santa Clara University. And my wife and my daughter and I were visiting my son and we're hiking through the woods near Santa Clara and we come across this rattlesnake. And so when we don't have rattlesnakes like this in Kansas where I live. So when you see a rattlesnake and you're on a hike, what do you do, of course? You take out your smartphone and you take a picture of the rattlesnake. <laughs> now, fortunately, no one in my family was bit by a rattlesnake, but my wife's sister is a doctor in Northern California, and she has told us that people come in her hospital that have been bitten by snakes. And there's a difference between the men that come in and the women that come in as to where they've been bitten by the snakes. The women that come in are usually bitten on the lower legs and ankles. The men that come in are bitten on the hands and the arms and even the face, the face. And they're bitten in those places because the guys try to pick up the snakes. 
They're in denial that they're going to get bit, so they pick up the snakes and invariably they get bit. In fact, the two most common things that are uttered by a man before a snake bite are these. Take my picture, hold my beer. <laughs> and they get bit because they're in denial. Now, I don't want anybody to get bit by a snake or anybody to get victimized by crime. If you're in denial that something could happen, we let our guard down. We're less vigilant. Just be careful and watch out for the fraud we're going to be talking about uh, to further today. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you about is the, some of the tricks. So we've talked about your social security number. We've talked about the importance of your mail and your trash. Let's talk about some of the tricks we see online. And I'll start off with the Nigerian letter, which has been around for a long time. And I know no one in this room is going to be wire transferring money to Nigeria, but it does happen. They have three things in common. They have lots of money. They need your services confidentially, of course. And they're going to give you a large portion of the money. It's always at least a million bucks. You know, you know why that's the case? Because down in Nigeria, they know that in America, in our culture, we don't get up off the couch unless there's at least $1 million to be had. There's got to be $1 million. Bucks. In this case, it's a lot more than a $1 million. Uh, but, and, and I interviewed someone who wire transferred $70,000 to Nigeria. And I asked her, ma'am, why did you do that? And she said, they had me absolutely convinced in my brain that I was going to get a million dollars when everything was finished. And what she was really saying is they were letting emotions overcome logic and common sense. She was. Emotions, are, we, use, we make decisions emotionally. Sometimes we can't control our emotions. And that's what drives us to do those type of things. I've talked to a man who was actually in the process of sending money. His family said, you've got to stop him. We can't talk him out of it. I said, sir, this is a scam. He says, no, I know about scams. I know, you know, I know that happens to people, but this is not one of them because he was thinking emotionally and not with his brain. We can't let logic overcome, be overcome by emotions. And uh, I'll just give you an example. We talked with a Nigerian scammer in, Can in Kansas City. He's in Nigeria. A police officer's talking with him. And the police officer says in the chat that we had on Yahoo, do you just laugh at the Americans who fall for these deals? And he said, no, I, I, it's, not, it's supposed to be on that. I pity them now. And the Nigerian knew, you know, we can't go down there to Nigeria and arrest anyone. It's pouring money into their country. Why would they have an incentive to stop it? So then the police officer says, how much do you make? And he said, a couple thousand a week. Now, it wasn't just Nigerian scams. The, the, the Nigerian went on to say the three most common ways he scams Americans are on Craigslist and eBay and dating sites. And in every case, they're trying to rip people off by negotiating and getting emotions to overcome logic and common sense. Now, here's the list. On, here's an example on Craigslist. Let's say I was shopping around for a car, and I'm going to buy something on Craigslist that's, uh, that's a car I found that's a great deal. Notice what Craigslist puts up on the top of the ad. And I'm not making this up. They put it up there themselves. Craigslist says offers to ship cars are 100% fraudulent. That's a fairly high rate of fraud. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> so what they're saying is that every case is fraud. But what they really mean is that if someone ever says to you, I send you, I send you a car after you ship me, after you wire transfer me the money, I'll ship you the car. I'd never do that because that's the number one way people get ripped off by wire transfers. If you're going to do business with someone through an e-commerce ad like Craigslist or eBay, you know, try to do business with people in person. If you can't, use PayPal or some other way where money transfer is more secure. Never through a wire transfer. 100% of the time, you're, you're going to lose money, according to Craigslist. And we see these things happening every day as well. Now, a lot of fraud can be prevented with common sense. But as I said, sometimes emotions overcome logic and common sense. So we have to make sure that doesn't happen. So to help to illustrate this point, I have a little story. This comes from the world of the mob. Now, we had a very active mob family in Kansas City when I first got there in the 1980s. And by the way, did you know the mob is self-insured against car accidents? I don't know if you knew that or not. They don't need Geico. They don't need Progressive. They have their own insurance. It's called captive insurance in the insurance business. Anyway, we had a mobster's phone tapped one time, and this was all about common sense. Tony is talking to Joe, and Tony gets a call from Joe. As the FBI listens, Tony says, Joe, I'm glad you called. And Joe says, why? Tony says, I have a problem. I think the FBI is tapping my phone. <laughs> so Joe says, what are you, you going to do about it? Tony says, I already got the problem figured out. I already got it solved. I got a new phone number. So lacking any common sense, Joe goes, G give me the number. <laughs> now, Tony gets a little common sense for a minute. He says, well, wait, wait. I better not give you the number over the phone. I'll meet you for lunch. I'll give it to you then. And Joe says, I can't meet you for lunch. And Joe says, OK, all right. I'll give you the number over the phone right now. But I'll give it to you backwards. <laughs> so he gave him the seven digits in reverse order. What did the FBI do? We got our best cryptologist on that one right away. <laughs> 
since we are the FBI with lots of resources, we can get the problem like that figured out in record time, and we did. Six months later, we had that new number figured out. It's amazing use of resources. So next time you get an email, next time you see you get something you think is suspicious, doesn't look right, think about Tony and Joe before you take action. It may help you be prevent becoming a victim of fraud. For example, let's say you get an email like this from the IRS, which is listed at the top there, which is what I got in my email box. The IRS does not send emails. This is where common sense comes in. They will not send you emails that have to do specifically with tax matters. They will not send you a Facebook status update. The IRS does not send you text messages. The IRS will not tweet to you either. They only send physical U.S. mail. So it doesn't make sense that I would get this from the IRS. Now, just opening the email probably doesn't harm my computer. What will harm my computer, though, is when I open the attachment. Just looking at the email probably is going to be okay. But when I open the attachment, I may infect my computer with malware, a virus. In this case, it's called the Zeus Trojan. Now, why is it called the Trojan? Because it sits on my computer silently and only awakens when we go to log in and type keystrokes on our computer. It becomes a keystroke logger and steals the keystrokes and sends it to the crooks so they can use it to access our accounts, maybe our email accounts, maybe LinkedIn, maybe Facebook, maybe our bank accounts. So that could be really serious stuff. To keep these off your computer, you don't click on links or attachments and emails from unknown senders. Even from known senders, their email account, your friend's email account could have been hijacked. And then that causes a problem as well because they don't even know what's happening. You think you're getting a message from a friend and it's actually a link to a bad site. Their email account was hijacked by the bad guys because they clicked your friend on an email, on a link to get to, to log into their email account rather than going there directly. More about that uh, in a couple of minutes. Now, you could do a little investigation on your own. Let's just say you get an email that you don't, you, don't, you're, 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 you don't know about the legitimacy of it. You know, you're questioning that, but you're not sure you should click on it or not. Or really anything that you come across, you can do is something very easy. Open up another window in your browser and go to Google and type in what you just saw online or whatever you're experiencing. It may be a phone call. Type in what you just saw and what you just heard and use that as a way to investigate yourself. So in this case, I typed in IRS phishing email, which is what I thought I, I had gotten, and Google auto-completes it for me. See, Google is, is, auto, is finishing this, the, 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 the query for me because it wants to save me keystrokes. And how do they know what I'm going to type in? They know what I'm going to type in because other people have already typed that in somewhere else. So that means other people are searching for it, which means other people are getting it, which means it's probably a scam. So now, if I follow through and click here, I know now that this is a scam because the IRS has several pages on their website which uh, have to who de with the deal with this issue. All right, it's an identity theft issue. It's an issue that's trying to steal your keystrokes uh, to log into your bank accounts, and the IRS is telling you about it and other scams here. So when in doubt, open up Google and search for what you just saw, and maybe you'll, do, you'll get a little uh, information before you can become a victim of fraud that might help you avoid uh, becoming a victim of fraud. All right, that next uh, thing that, that brings me to is account takeovers. So the, if I want to take over your bank account and take money out of your bank account, I need two things. I need your username and I need your password. And there's two ways to get that. The first way to get that is through malware, which I just described with the IRS phishing email, infecting your computer with the Zeus Trojan. The second way to get that is through a fake website. So let's take a look at how this might work. Here's one that came from into my email account from Bank of America, supposedly. Now, it's not Bank of America, and you could substitute in any bank that you want here. This is just an example, but a real example. So they cut and paste the logo and the slogan into the email to make it look more realistic. And what they're trying to do is get me to click on the link to go to my Bank of America account if I was a Bank of America customer. You never click on links to go to email, to go to email accounts as well, but also especially not to bank accounts. Now, how do I know this is fake? Well, first of all, banks don't send these type of things out, but you can also look at the web address, and whatever appears on the, in the web address that you're about to click on, right before the first single slash in any web address is the official name of the website that you're going to. So you see here, that's not Bank of America. That's something called bizweb.com. So you're not going to go there because it's not Bank of America's site. It's something else. It's bizweb. Now, you can also, they can spoof it and make it look more realistic. So here, they're making it look... Like it's, like it's the Bank of America site, because right before the first single slash, it says bankofamerica.com. So maybe I think that is the actual site. But it, again, you don't want to go there through a link. And you can also do some more investigation here by not clicking on the link, but hovering over the link. So take your browser and hover over uh, the link in the email. And before you click on it, don't click. Just hover there for a minute, and you will see a little pop-up that comes up in your browser. That's a preview of where you would go 
if you were to click on it, and you can see this is not Bank of America's site, this is again back to that bizweb.com, and look at the last two letters of the, of the web address. That's the country code where the server is hosting that website, it's physically located. So in this case, it's not the US, if it was, it would say .us. If it happened to be in Canada, it'd be .ca. That country code is for the Ukraine, .ua is the Ukraine. Now the Ukraine is probably not hosting Bank of America's websites on servers in their country. That would be unusual, because the Ukrainians are having a ton of problems today. They have 40 million people that live in the former Soviet Republic, and 39 million of them are professional hackers. Yeah. It just seems that way anyway, so you wouldn't want to go there. Now let's just say you let your guard down. Let's say you let your guard down and you clicked. You're going to come up with a site that looks like this. This is not Bank of America's site. It's, the, it's a fake site, and if you put in your username and password, you're giving it to the crooks. Now you're not going to be able to log into your site, your Bank of America site, or any bank, because it's not their site. But what might come up on your computer is this. And here is the point where you stop everything that you're doing if this comes up on your computer, and you get out the fraud hotline number for your bank or the personal banker that you know, and you call them right away and you say, this has happened to me when I try to log into your bank account. And you should have, as a matter of precaution, have your banker's number and the fraud hotline for your bank on your cell phone, on your smartphone, so you can call it right away if you have an issue. If this happens, you want to let the bank know, because a lot of times fraud can be prevented if we contact the bank soon enough. Now, I say all this not to dissuade you from doing online banking. I do online banking. I do banking on my phone. I do mobile banking. I take pictures of checks to deposit checks in my bank account so I don't have to go down to the bank. And I feel totally secure with doing all that. You just have to keep your guard up, be vigilant, and watch out for things that are suspicious. And know this, if you have one penny taken out of your bank account that's due to fraud, the bank is required by federal law and state law to refund that money to you as long as you pay it back in 60 days. That's true for individual accounts. So if you have those accounts set up, you're not liable for any problems with online banking as long as you report it in a timely manner. So this is not an issue where you're going to experience any, any, any problems losing money if something were to happen to you. But it's not because you're going to be careful. Now that brings me to my next point, uh, which is, uh, I, I, I should also show you this. This is the uh, Chase email, the fake Chase phishing email, which did not come from Chase. Now it looks real, right? Now I am a Chase, I'm not a Bank of America customer, but I am a Chase customer. And I can see the logo in there, so maybe it's real, but this is another fake phishing email designed to get me to click there and go here. And if I go here, this is not Chase's site. How do I know that? Well, it looks kind of funny to begin with, and also look at the dot RU in there at the end. What country do you think the server is located hosting that website in Russia? I doubt Chase has websites being hosted by servers in Russia. Now, here's a real one. I am a Chase customer, I have a Chase credit card, and I get this once a month. Your statement is ready for viewing. Even with this, I'm not going to go to the website directly because I know this is probably from Chase because it has my name in it, first of all. It has my name in the top left. It also has the four the last four of, of my uh, credit card number, so they personalized it. So I know now this is probably actually from Chase, but I'm not still going to click on the link to get there. I'm going to go to chase.com, store it in my browser as a bookmark. I'm not going to even type it in because I might make a mistake and m make a misspelling, and then I'm sent to another bogus site. So you have Chase stored in your browser. You click on it. It is a bookmark, and you go there directly. I download my available statement, never through a link, because you're not 100% sure that that link is a legitimate link. All right, I want to move on and talk next about your, uh, your communication. So this is an article that was in Poplar Mechanics Magazine in 1950. They predicted back in 1950 miracles that we would see by the year 2000. They predicted by the year 2000 that we'd be eating food from sawdust. Right? So they got that one wrong. They predicted further that we'd be cooking on a solar range, so they got that one wrong. Right? But here's what they kind of got right. I'll give them half credit for this. They predicted by the year 2000 we'd be shopping by picture phone. Well, we are shopping with screens in our hands and screens in our desks, but not, not in, with televisions and landlines like this. I mean, I mean uh, they had the concept right, so we'll give them a little bit of credit. Right? But how could they have known, real, really, in 1950, the advent of cell phone technology? That one day, we were able to walk around with this modern wireless device that looks like this. An amazing piece of technology. <laughs> The reason why that guy's got that smug look on his face is because he's just downloaded some really cool apps on that thing. Now, if you charge that thing, oh, by the way, I should point out to you, that was in, uh, the product, the, the state of the art in 1983, you think the iPhone 6 is expensive, and if you charge that thing for eight full hours, you got 15 minutes of talk time before the battery ran dead. 
Now, we've come a long way with, with uh, cell phones and cellular technology. Most people in this room are carrying one form or another, some type of smartphone. And there's a way to keep safe with these. So let me cover with you just a little bit about smartphone security. Just one thing really to stay safe and one thing only is have the password because your phone could be lost, it could be stolen, and the passcode, that four-digit code, or a fingerprint on the iPhones in version five or six allows you to protect the information on the phone. If you lose it, you can try to find it. In the meantime, you know, you can wipe it clean. If you can't find it, you can wipe all the data off there. If it gets stolen, and lots of phones are stolen today, it's, it's in epidemic proportions, you can wipe the information off. Most crooks, most crooks steal cell phones not for, the, not for the value of the information, but the value of the product. But let's not make the information a byproduct. Having the passcode protects that information. I'll give you one example from the city of San Francisco. iPhone thefts are at, at an all-time high. Smartphones in general, but iPhones in particular, because they're so valuable on the black market, five or six hundred dollars for the newest versions of iPhones. They're taking them right out of people's hands on the mass transit systems. The police chief is up in arms, he's at his wit's end. He's made a public statement. He's telling people in San Francisco, do not read your electronic devices on the mass transit system. He's telling people to read books instead because no one's stealing books from people. They're only stealing electronic devices. So as these devices get stolen, let's not make the information a byproduct. Let them have the device, we'll get a new device, but let's, not, let's protect their information with the, pa with the passcode, of course. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is your computer communication. And there's five things here that I think are very important. And we'll talk about five basic things. First of all, if you didn't go looking for it, don't download it. So you're on the computer, and something comes up and says, download this program to see this video. Download this program to see a picture. Download it to do something, don't download it. You weren't there looking for it. It could be malware, it could infect your computer. Number two, if you did go looking for it and you did download it or it's already on your computer, then update it. So you have Adobe, you have Java, you have all sorts of programs that make our computer work. And every once in a while, sometimes very often, the makers of those programs find vulnerabilities. They find mistakes and bugs that could lead the hackers to get back doors into our computer. When they ask you to update it, update it. And uh, not through the link like this, not through the pop-up, update it directly on the website. Always keep your software programs updated, including Internet Explorer, including Windows itself, because they are constantly finding problems with that that could lead our computer to get infected. Number three, we kind of alluded to this already, beware of links and emails. So Johnny Rowe, I've changed the name a little bit. He is a friend of mine. He sends me this link. All I get is a link, no message. I'm not going to click on the link. What is this link? I don't know. It could send me to a website where they're going to try to uh, scam me or spam me. It could be send me to a place where if I click on something, someone's going to get paid a nickel every time I click and other people click on it. it could, they, they could try to infect my computer with malware, maybe make my computer part of a robot network. That's called a botnet, which is a big issue today as well. I'm not going to click on this link. And the reason why he sent me that is because he has no idea he sent it to me. The bad guys took over his email account. That's called hijacking. And when they hijack his email account, they're trying to use his relationship with me for me to click on it. Because, hey, he's my friend. I'm going to click on what he sent me. But it's not him sending it to me. Now, the reason why he got his email account hijacked is because he logged into Yahoo or Gmail the wrong way. He logged in through a pop-up or through a link, not directly on the website, in his, uh, the bookmark stored in his browser. And that's the same thing we see in the financial industry. Your financial advisor literally gets probably a dozen emails a week coming from customers' accounts that, where their account has been hijacked saying, why are transferring me money? I'm at a funeral. You can't call me back. Oh, I don't have my phone with me. My battery's dead. Just send money to this account. And at Foster and Motley, they're not going to send money to anyone unless they talk to you first. And that's a level of protection for you. And it's the same in other financial advisors. But the truth is, it's because our email accounts are getting hijacked that's not even hap that that's happening at all. The fourth thing about email or commu computer communication is transact securely. So when I'm online, I don't need to have a secure site if I'm not putting information in. I don't need the S at the end of HTTP. Let's just say I was shopping for a jar of barbecue sauce, and I go to this website. I don't need to have a secure site because I'm only shopping, I'm only browsing, I'm not putting anything in the site at this point in time. When I do go to buy this, when I go to put in to, to, to finalize my shopping cart and to pay for my goods, I want to have the HTTP change to HTTPS. So that stands for secure, and that's an indication the transaction is encrypted and secure. Does that mean it's 100% guaranteed secure? 
Not necessarily, but it's pretty close, and we could be comfortable doing it. However, because there's nothing is 100% secure, I would not use a debit card online. If you get defrauded because of a credit card transaction where an account was stolen because of an online communication, you're, you're not out any money. You see a credit card transaction like the lady in Cheesecake Factory restaurant, they take it off her bill. We're not out a dime. If that's a debit card, they can drain your account down to zero balance. Now, the bank will put the money back eventually, but it's going to take time to deal with the bank to get money back. And who wants to go through that hassle? So debit cards not used online, only credit cards online, and make sure you have the S in the, in the HTTP, at the end of the HTTP, signifying a secure transaction. All right, the fifth thing about computer transactions is to make sure you keep your computer protected. Now, I know you've heard this before. If you have a Mac, you probably do not need antivirus software. At least that's what they tell you at Apple, because most viruses are written for PCs. But if you do have a PC, make sure you stay protected. Free versions, paid versions, Windows 7, Windows 8 has built-in antivirus and, vi and firewalls. It's a great thing to keep our computers safe. But don't, make it, don't let it lapse. Never go unprotected online because you, would get, you will invariably get infected with a piece of malware. And these guys do a great job of taking that, uh, of, of keeping it off. But as far as taking it off, they can't do it all the time. Some of those programs get embedded deeply at the root level of our computer, and these guys won't even find it. And you'll have lots of problems. So the best, best method is just to keep it off to begin with, and these guys always have to be running and updated and active. Now, with that being said, technology doesn't always work. Technology does protect us, but it's not foolproof. Technology does sometimes fail. So let me illustrate that with a little story from the world of the FBI in Kansas City. We had a drug dealer's house bugged with a video camera, it's all court authorized. We're allowed to go in there and install this video camera, which we did. It has a transmitter on it. The transmitter is broadcasting to the FBI office in Kansas City. We're recording what's going on. And the drug dealers one day are not dealing drugs. They're actually sitting around watching a TV like this. It's an old fashioned TV. Even though this was modern times, I mean, this is just a few years ago, the drug dealers are watching this old TV with no, uh, no cable connection. And just these rabbit ear antennas that you see here. And it beckons back to the days of past, which is really a sad, sad day in our lives when we actually had to get up off the couch to change a channel on the television. So they had no remote control. And the drug dealers are watching the favorite show of drug dealers one day. We're watching them watch the favorite show of drug dealers. Do you know what that is, by the way? It's not Cops, because Cops is the second favorite show of drug dealers. And I hope it's not Breaking Bad, because that's my favorite show. It better not be the favorite show of drug dealers. No, they're watching the first favorite show of drug dealers, which is the Jerry Springer show, <laughs> all right? So one of the drug dealers gets up to change the channel from Jerry Springer to something else, but something weird happens with technology before he can do that. He goes over to the TV, he touches the TV, and the TV moves, the antenna shifts a little bit, and all of a sudden, inexplicably, the antenna starts picking up the signal from our hidden video camera and transmitter in the house. So you know what happens next. The sw signal switches from Jerry Springer to them on TV. They see themselves on the television, and they're going crazy. How did we get on TV? What are we doing on TV? <laughs> We're back at the FBI office going, oh, the whole case is blown now. The wire's shot. You know, they'll never go to jail. Well, they solved the problem really simply. How do you fix a problem like that? No big deal. You take a blanket, and you put it over the TV so you no longer could see yourself on TV. <laughs> so they covered the TV with a blanket. And now we're back at the FBI office thinking, what could possibly happen now? Well, what happened after that was right out of a 1970s situation comedy, the ringleader of the group walks in, and he, and he asks what I thought was a very appropriate question, why is there a blanket covering the TV? And so they tell him, we were watching Jerry Springer, and then we were on TV. No, no, you weren't. He doesn't believe him. Yes, we were. No, you weren't. Wait a minute. Let me check your drug supply. You weren't, using, you weren't using your drugs, were you? You weren't on TV. Yes, we were. We'll show you. They take the blanket. They whip it off. The TV moves. The antenna shifts. At the instant the blanket comes off, it goes immediately back to the signal from Jerry Springer. <laughs> the ringleader's like, that's Jerry Springer. What are you talking about? No, we were just on there. We swear we were just on there. Get out of here. You weren't on there. So in this nice little gated community, a gated community in a town called Leavenworth, Kansas, they're still talking about that today behind federal bars and outside of the penal system, we're still talking about it. Sometimes technology just doesn't work as, as, as it's supposed to. I'm sure everyone in this room has had an example, you know, where your phone doesn't work right, maybe your computer does something weird, it goes to a blue screen, and then you reboot it, everything comes back to normal. You don't know how it happened, you don't know why it happened, that's the nature of technology. We can't trust it all the time, so we are vigilant, we keep an eye on things, we're careful, our behavior is the backup to the technology. 
All right, so let's talk about the, uh, the next thing on here is stopping crooks cults. Here's a category of things that I wanted to mention to you that I think might help you overall in, uh, in being more secure. First of all is the, uh, the type of phishing phone calls that we might get from the IRS, for example. Now, this, is not a phishing, this is not a phishing email, it's a phishing phone call. IRS leaves a message on someone's answering machine. I saw this in another city. Uh, we, le, you gotta pay us the money that you owe, and if you don't call us back right away, we're gonna come out and arrest you. You know, that type of thing. So they're intimidating people. It's really crooks trying to get personal information. If anyone ever calls you, anyone, and wants information from you, don't respond. If you call someone, and you know that's the person of the, the company who you're calling, and that's the number for that company, then yeah, give them information, but or limited information. You could verify the last four of your social. You could, you could verify the last four of your credit card. If you've called them, of course you can. Even give them the whole credit card number, but not when someone calls you. All right, so that's a scam that's going around right now. The grandchild in trouble. Grandma, it's me. Yeah, it, 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 Jimmy. Yeah, it's Jimmy. Jimmy, it's you? Yeah, it's me. I'm, Grandma, I've been arrested in Canada. You got to help me out. Don't tell my parents. Whatever you do, I'll get in big trouble. All right, you got to send me some money, Grandma. I need some money for, for bail. And these bad guys, the, 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 the detective put me in jail. He can, talk, he, he, he can talk to you right now, tell you how to get me out of jail. And before I give the phone to him, uh, you can't call us back. I only get this one phone call. Every grandparent wants to help their grandchildren. Right? And this has been a, a, a case where 25,000 victims in the United States last year. AARP Magazine had an article about it. Millions of dollars in losses. So educate people about the phishing phone calls, the, uh, the, the attempt to get people to wire transfer money based on a grandchild in trouble. And then there's the Microsoft support call. This is where someone calls you up. They have a very American sounding name and a very foreign sounding accent. <laughs> this is Microsoft, we need access to your computer and uh, because we detected viruses on your computer. Now, if you called Microsoft, and you should never call the number that comes up in a Google search, because that's likely to be someone that's not Microsoft. It's gonna be another company that's gonna try to bill you for something that Microsoft wouldn't bill you for, for instance. But no, get, save the number when you buy a computer. Get the exact number you know to be Microsoft. Call them directly, not through a Google search. And then if you do get a phone call, of course it's not Microsoft, never give them information, never let them take ac uh, you know, remote access to your computer. All right. I also want to talk about your, uh, uh, just a couple of things about, about scams we get in the mail and the email accounts. No, one, no one's sending, giving away anything for free. Even if they say they're Amazon, they say they're Walmart, they're not. They're not giving you away a free gift cards. Never click on these links. And here, the question is often asked, should I unsubscribe to these things when I get these? If it's something like this, don't unsubscribe. Mark it as spam and hopefully your computer email program will send it to spam in the future and you'll get less of these. If you unsubscribe to these, you've just told the people that's a valid email address, and then they'll use that and you, to send it to other people who will send you more spam. Now, if you get an email from Marriott, you get an email uh, from Kohl's, and, and you know it looks like their site, you can unsubscribe from those. Those are legitimate sites. They have to, by law, take you off their email. That's the, spam, uh, the, the CAN Spam Act of 2003. They have to do that. But something like this, don't unsubscribe because they, they, they don't adhere to any, any laws here in the United States. All right, I also want to talk about your credit report. You can check your credit very easily, annualcreditreport.com. This is on your handout. If you have uh, your identity stolen, it's a good chance it's going to show up on your credit report uh, very quickly. So you might want to check that to see if you've had issues with your credit report. You may not find out about that otherwise for weeks or months. And so you can check your credit report three times a year for free. Each of these agencies, by law, has to provide you with one free credit report per year. And you can do it at annualcreditreport.com. Do you have to put in your social security number to get it? Yes, you do, but your computer is safe. You're not responding to a, 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 a you're not clicking on a link. They're not responding to some email that says, get your free credit report. You're logging into annualcreditreport.com. All right, we have more stuff to cover. I wanna talk about passwords, social networking, wrap it up with a story, see if you have any questions. This is important now. This is a little video that's gonna show you how to stay engaged. This is how you do it when someone's talking to you about a very important topic. Here's how you do it. I've had planned to protect small business owners, local officials, the high sheriff is with us today. Worried about the quality of the education of the community in this group, they can receive federal support for their work. If you can, try to be more engaged than that, if you can, all right? I know, you know, maybe a glass of wine or two. If you do get tired at all during the next 10 minutes, just grab your head and go like this, and it'll, it'll help you stay awake. So, so these are the most common passwords in use in the United States. And, and I'm, I'm really not making this up because this comes right out of Wall's, the Wall Street Journal. The most common passwords in use. And as you see these come up, which two do you think are the two most common passwords of the ones you see appear on the screen here? All right. 
Password and QWERTY, the first six letters on the top of the keyboard. People want to make it easy for themselves. There's a trade-off between convenience and security, right? What do you think the most common PIN number is? ATM PIN number. It's 1234, but also 2580, right down the center. People want to make it easy for themselves. You lose your ATM card, first thing the crook tries, 1234-2580. So you don't want to have those as your PIN, as your, as your PIN numbers. Uh, so I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, giving a presentation. And the audience was made up of bank employees with their name tags on, their badges, sitting like you are here. And this came up on the screen. You know, same, same story. And, and the guy in the front row, after this comes up, he goes like this. Yes. And yes. And I go, why did you go yes? And he goes, because my name's not up there on the screen. <laughs> I, I, go, I go, good. Well, now I know your password. It's printed right on your badge there. Now, there's a reason why we use strong passwords, and the reason is because bad guys can use a computer program to guess passwords, Brutus Password Cracker. And so this is what you use. You want to have at least eight characters in, in, as a strong password with upper and lower case. That gives you lots of possibilities, not six characters with just plain lower case, because that's it, they can get, use a computer program using brute force methods to guess my password in just in under 10 minutes. It's going to be less than those numbers you see up there. Now, a strong password with eight characters, upper lower case, and a special character like a dollar sign, exclamation point, asterisk, will give you six quadrillion possibilities. And, and for, for this audience, you know immediately that a billion is a thousand million, a trillion is a thousand billion, and a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. That's a big number. And even password crackers can't guess that, that fast. So protect your accounts with a strong password. I know what you're thinking. I can't have different strong passwords for all my accounts. And I understand that. And so here, I might I suggest this, how about just having one password for the social side of your life, a second strong password for the, for the backup email accounts that we use. If you have a problem with an email account, it gets hacked into, you forget your password, you have a secondary email to recover that password. We all have those set up with our Gmail and IU accounts and so forth. And have a third strong password for the banking side of your life. You know, the, the, so, the, the, the financial accounts, your Motley your Motley password, uh, Foster Motley account. You, those are the passwords that you don't use over here because the bad guys get it over there, they can't use it on the other side of your life. So three strong passwords for different aspects of your life. I may also suggest to you that there are password programs out there, we call them managers or vaults, that help you manage passwords. It's much safer to use a vault like this, Keeper, which is something I use on my cell phone. I always have my passwords with me. It's protected with two layers of security, the password to get on the phone, the password to get on this application. It's encrypted, no one can get access to it, even if my phone were stolen. I have them there with me, because I travel a lot, and I need to have my passwords. I can't remember them all. It's safer than writing it down in an Excel spreadsheet, a Word document, and having it on your computer. If you want to save passwords on your computer, there's applications that do that. Dashlane is one of them. LastPass, KeePass. These are just ideas for you. I'm not selling anything, I'm just telling you these are products that are out there that people have liked, and I happen to like Keeper as, uh, as one, $10 a year. All right, switch gears here a little bit. What's the most populated country in the world? China, how about number two? All right, now number three, if it were a country, it would be Facebook, if it were a country, right? More people on Facebook than live not just in the United States, but the whole continent of North America. So Facebook's become a target for scammers, right? People are going after us on our Facebook page, and more people on Facebook uh, to go after, you know, over a billion people. And, uh, you know, Facebook is very addicting for some people. Uh, some people are very addicted to it. In fact, this guy goes into a house in West Virginia. He burglarizes the house, and while he's in the house burglarizing it, he can't resist the temptation to log into the victim's computer and update his Facebook status. Now here's what he typed in, oh my gosh, laugh out loud, break it into someone's house. Right. Now, now you know OMG is oh my gosh, the laugh out loud, the Z on the end of laugh out loud, that's the plural of laugh out loud. So he was laughing out loud a lot, he was cracking himself up, and he didn't notice that little box was checked that said keep me logged in, so he X's out of Facebook and doesn't log out of Facebook, and the victim comes home and she files her police report about the stolen jewelry, later she gets on Facebook and she goes to log in, but who's already logged in on Facebook? The guy who burglarized her house. So she calls the police, here he is right here. And then just for grins, she sent him a friend request right after that. <laughs> uh, if I want to hack your Facebook account, I can hire a professional to do it. Here's a guy, here's a guy who's advertising Facebook hacks. And even, even the hackers have volume discounts. So he's saying, hey, for 100 bucks, I'll hack a Facebook account. But for 300 bucks, I'll hack for the whole year for you. 
right? Even the hackers have disclaimers. I can't, it's not possible to hack always any Facebook account because some passwords are well protected. So he's talking about strong passwords there. Even out of the mouth of a hacker, he's saying, use a strong password, I can't crack it. Now, most people get their Facebook account hacked just like email, you log in the wrong way. So don't log into Facebook through a link like this. It could be a phony link that leads you to a bad site. So here's the bad site. It's not really Facebook. It has two Ks. You may not even notice that. And they could spoof that to make it look even more realistic. You put in your email and your password, and then your Facebook account gets hijacked. Now, what does that do? What are they going to do with my Facebook account? Well, all your friends on Facebook would get messages like this, possibly. I'm stranded. I need money to pay my hotel bill. I've been attacked and robbed. Now, I know no one in this room is going to run down to Western Union and wire transfer $2,000 plus dollars to somebody as a result of getting a Facebook message, but that has happened before. Now, more serious than that is when they try to infect my computer through Facebook. And now this guy sent me, he's a friend of mine, he sends me, hey, Jeff, what are you doing in this video? I'm not in a video he's seen. That doesn't make sense. See, this is where common sense comes in. I'm not going to click there because I'm not in a video he's seen, and if I let my emotions ha overcome that, I'm, hey, I'm in a video, I, I got to see if he's my friend. Why would he try to infect my computer? No, but it's not my friend. Someone hijacked his account. He's trying to infect my computer. So then if I click on that, it's going to tell me I need to download a flash player to see the video. So that's the key. That's how I get the malware on my computer. It's not a flash player to see the video. It's actually the Kube face worm. And why is it called Kube face? It's an anagram of Facebook. Whoever designed it designed it to go after us on our Facebook page because they knew we let our guard down on social networking sites, tweet, uh, t Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. You know, we think we're talking to our friends, and especially on Facebook, because people are using it all the time, and they're really fast. They've got to update us on everything they're doing, right? Every place they've been, they're here, they're there, they take pictures. They, what they ate for lunch, they're putting it out there, but they're not thinking, you know, about when they're doing those things, because they've got to update themselves, update it so quickly. So they're not thinking they might get victimized by something like this just when you log in. So be careful on Facebook. Always log in directly, never through a link. All right, so we've talked about a ton of stuff so far today, and I just want to kind of wrap it up with a story and then uh, see if you have any questions after that. I'll show you a couple of pictures, and then, we'll, and then we'll see if you do have some questions. Now, here's my story, because I don't want you to be victimized by someone who seeks information from you. So always verify that you, who's to, who you're talking to before you provide information, all right, and why they need the information. So here's my little summary story to help illustrate that point. I grew up in Connecticut. I live in Kansas City metro area now, but I grew up in Connecticut. I come from a big Italian family. There were five boys in my family. And every Christmas on Christmas Day, we sat around the TV and we watched this movie that taught me a lot about life. This movie that we watched taught me about how business should be conducted. It taught me about loyalty. Have you seen this movie? All right, this is not the movie we watched on Christmas Day. It was actually this movie that we watched on Christmas Day. <laughs> And I'm not making this up. This past year, we watched all three versions of The Godfather, not on Christmas Day. That would have been nine hours. That would have been a little too much. So we spread it out over Christmas and New Year's, the week between. Now, I was always interested in the mob. That's why I liked the movie The Godfather. So you can imagine my excitement now. I got assigned to the Kansas City Division of the FBI. I'm working white-collar crime when I first got there. And I'm sitting around a white-collar crime squad area. It's a Friday afternoon, about 10 minutes to 5. A guy from our organized crime squad comes walking down the hall. He sticks his head in, and he goes, hey, anybody want to go on a search warrant on Sunday? We need a volunteer. When you're new in the FBI, you want to do everything. And I knew it, I knew it was an organized crime case because he was on the OC squad, organized crime squad, and I wanted to work that anyway. So I put my hand up. I go, I'll go along. So that Sunday morning, we show up at a bookie's house. Now, this is not online gambling like we have today. This is old-fashioned bookie taking bets over the phone, and it's time to bust the bookie. We have his phone tapped and it's time to bring the bookie down. We serve a search warrant at the bookie's house. Search warrant looked like this. I'm talking, I'm, uh, the agent is interviewing the bookie like over here in the room, and I'm at the bookie's desk, and he's got all his bookmaking materials here. He's got his scores from yesterday, his betting lines, right? It's a Sunday morning. It's September, so baseball is in season. Football is in season. I'm sitting at a bookie's desk. What do you think might happen next under those circumstances? The phone rings, and I'm not sure what to do because I'm new in the bureau. I ask Al, Al, what do you want me to do? The phone's ringing. He says, pick it up. So I've answered the phone. Now, before I tell you what happened next, let me back up just a little bit. In Connecticut, where I grew up, my dad owned a business. He owned a retail store. It was a variety store, a convenience store. We called it Jet Variety. This is what it looked like in about, oops, in about 1973. So I'm in my dad's store working there throughout my teenage years. And because we're in the New York metro area, we sold new a newspaper called the New York Post. Now, you've heard of the Denver Post. You've heard of the Washington Post. 
The New York Post is nothing like that. The New York Post had headlines like this. You know, the New York Post, typical headline from the New York Post. It was also the newspaper that told us that Tiger Woods wasn't really a tiger. He was actually a cheetah. <laughs> so that's the New York Post for you. Now, the New York Post, by the way, is my, my first and most credible source of information. That's where I go to get my news every day. I go to the New York Post. These guys would come in my dad's store who bet with their bookie back in the 70s. And they used to come in the store because the, the Post had the best sports section. They'd buy it, and they'd flip it over. That was the sports section. If you flipped in about four pages, you'd find the betting lines, which looked like this. All right. Now, I, I didn't know anything about gambling at the time. These guys in my dad's store would come in, and they'd talk about what games they were going to bet on with their bookie that day. And they'd say things like, I'm taking uh, Baltimore minus two. I'm taking Denver minus seven. I'm taking the over on the Bengals, 44 and a half. And I'd hear all the lingo and the parlance of gambling. Right? And as a teenager who knew nothing about gambling, I learned it all just listening to these guys in my dad's store. And that's my story. I'm, I'm sticking to it. Now, <laughs> fast forward 15 years. I'm in the FBI. They've given me a gun, which I have here. I've got an FBI badge, which I have here. I got my Ray jacket on, which they gave me for the search warrant, to use at the search warrant. It's that blue jacket with FBI yellow letters on the back. You've probably seen it on TV. You know, so I'm at the bookie's desk. The, uh, the, uh, the phone rings. Al, the agent with me, says, pick it up. I pick it up. The guy on the phone on the other end goes, who's this? I tell him my real name. I'm not undercover. We're just busting the bookie. So I tell him the truth. I go, it's Jeff. He doesn't say, Jeff who? He doesn't say, Jeff, where's my bookie today? He goes, hey, Jeff, what's the line on the Chiefs today? So I knew how to read the lines. I remember from my dad's store, and the bookie had it right there. So I figured, why not just tell him? I, see, I say, Chiefs are minus three. He goes, give me 50 on the Chiefs. I go, you got it. So I take down the guy's bet. Phone rings again. Guy wants to do an over bet on the Vikings. Jeff, what's the over under on the Vikings? I look at the bookie's page. He's got it 44-45. Total points scored in the game. You can go over or under to win your bet. So I tell him it's 44-45. How much you want? He goes, I want 75 on the over. I go, you got it. So I take down his bet. <laughs> the phone calls are coming in. One guy calls up, wants to do something different, a parlay bet. Now, a parlay's a little different. Two-team parlay, three-team parlays. You got to win them all, but you get odds. It's a combination bet. He wants to do a two-team parlay. He forgot what the odds were on a two-team parlay, so he asked me. He goes, hey, Jeff, I'm thinking about doing a two-team parlay. What's that pay? Well, I remember from my dad's store, they talked about parlay. A two-team parlay pays 12 to 5. I mean, who doesn't know that? So I ask him. <laughs> so I say, how much do how much you want to bet? He goes, 50. I'll go pay 120 if you win, but you got to win both. He goes, okay, I got it. Give me Yankees and Jets, two-team parlay. I go, you got it. So not only am I taking their bets, I'm instructing them on how to bet at this point. <laughs> And there's only one person in this whole scheme of things that's questioning the fact that some strange guy named Jeff is answering the phone taking bets. One person. And that person is the FBI agent on the wire downtown. <laughs> he's, he's got the headphones on. He's going, wait a minute. Two agents go in there. They take out this bookie. I, I got that part. Now some other bookie named Jeff is answering the phone. <laughs> one guy calls up, and he is so loose with his information. He goes, hey, Jeff, I don't know you. But you, I get paid on Tuesdays. If I win, you're still paying, right? And I play along. What are you going to do? I just play along. I go, yeah, 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 we'll pay you. Don't worry. He gives me his first name, last name, address, and he spells it out by letter to make sure we had it. This is Mike Smith. That's a my TH. I live at 333 Maple, M-A-P-L-E, Kansas City, Missouri, 64105. You're still coming over on Tuesday, right? I go, oh, yeah, Mike, we'll be over. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> So that goes on for about an hour. Finally, guy calls up, smart guy. He's checking my credentials. He calls up. He goes, Jeff. He goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Jeff who? So I tell him the truth. I'm not undercover. We're just busting the bookie. I go, Jeff with the FBI. And I thought I was going to hear click. No, I don't hear click. I hear him cracking up hysterically. Jeff with the FBI. That's a good one. Answering the bookie's phone. Jeff with the FBI. I love it. Jeff with the FBI. Yeah, yeah, good. Hey, Jeff with the FBI. Give me 50 on the Chiefs, will you? I learned, I learned two things that day. We're too loose with information, so lock it down. The second thing I learned was how to take action over the phone. So we got the Royals playing the Giants tomorrow night. Give me a call. I got the lines, the over, under, so just give me a go. My number's on the handout. Thank you. All right, so listen, a couple more things. Well, wait, wait, we just got a couple more things. So we have an epidemic of crime in the United States, right? In the 1930s, we fought against the hoodlums. In the 1980s, we fought against the mobsters. And we mitigated these problems with a lot of good FBI and police work, not just the FBI, but lots of agencies. Today, we are outgunned, according to the FBI. Their hackers are staying one step ahead of us. So it comes down to two things. It comes down to, number one, technology that we use, but also our behavior. 
and our behavior has to be appropriate. So I hope some of the things we've talked about tonight will help you. Now, if the FBI, I'm going to back up for just a second. If the FBI worked a case where you were a victim, it's too late. Something's already happened. And if the FBI did show up at your door, you know, they, the way they show you their credentials is very important because this is a certain way we do this. And if they don't do it this way, it may not be a real FBI agent. If I was going to interview this gentleman, I'd say, sir, I'm with the FBI. And I would take out my credentials like this, out of my front, my pocket right here, this front pocket, and I'd simply flip them open like this. FBI, can I talk to you for a minute? This is called the FBI flip. You flip them open and hold them about shoulder height. Now, now, and you hold it right here. Now, these are now stamped in red, retired. So I can't use them to arrest anyone but I can use them to get out of a speeding ticket. I just, <laughs> I flip them out the window, but the flip, instead of this flip, it's this flip towards the police officer that pulled me up. No, we don't really do that, but the FBI agent should flip you like this. No, not flips like this or like this. This is the official flip. Now, some people don't like getting flipped by the FBI. I walked up to a lady one time. I said, ma'am, Jeff Land's the FBI. Can I speak with you for a minute? She didn't want to be flipped by me. So she looks at my credentials. She says, FBI. She takes out her flip cell phone, she flips it open, she says, Dolores Woods, not FBI. <laughs> I was counter-flipped by Dolores Woods with a cell phone. Listen, if we did a case that involved you, I hope it never happens, but then we call a press conference to announce the case, and we look like this. Here's a picture of me talking to the media on the front of my book. I wrote a book about communication, and I had the artist draw a picture of me on the cover talking to the media, because the media sometimes ask the most ridiculous questions, right? You know, and so I said, put a gun in my hand, because that will help intimidate the media. You know. And so, by the way, um, you too can own this book if you're interested, if anyone wants to. Yeah. My wife will be selling the book later if anyone's interested. But in any case, enough of that stuff. So, so one time the rep a reporter says this, totally off the wall question. She goes, Agent Lanza, Agent Lanza, how do you know a meth lab when you sell one? A meth lab. All right, here's how I answer that question. How do you know a meth lab when you sell one, when you see one? All right, there's a yellow lab. There's a black lab. There's your chocolate lab, and there's your meth lab right there. <laughs> Very scary looking dog. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the handouts are yours. You can download copies, PDF files to send to friends, relatives, colleagues if you want to. But there's one more piece of paper that I need everyone to fill out, and that's this one. Please fill this out and provide it to me. All right. Uh, now time for questions. If you should have any questions, I'm going to ask the uh, people here, my host, to, to pass the mic around if you have any questions. Do we have a microphone to ask, uh, to ask a question of anyone in the audience? And we have one right here, sir. Can you wait till the microphone gets there? And, uh, and he, we got it right coming right now. So let's see if you have any questions that I can try to answer for you tonight. Hi. One of the first things you mentioned was to um, consider the vulnerability of your social security number. And then you went on to say, don't think you're not going to be a victim. Now, that seems like a cross signal. Mm -hmm. If I'm to assume that it is in jeopardy, which from all you told us, it certainly is, then I wouldn't be paranoid in taking the steps that you suggested. Is that correct? Yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea to take steps already. So, for example, you could put a fraud alert on your account, even if you don't think you've been victimized. You can put a fraud alert or freeze on your account, even if you don't think your social security number is out there. But the reason why I said we're vulnerable is because we can do all the things we talked about tonight, but JP Morgan loses social security numbers. Other companies do as well. And when that happens, we're still at risk. Now, they have to notify you when that happens, and you should be keeping a close eye on your credit accounts in the meantime. But certainly, you could take any of these steps preemptively as well. And, and the suggestion was made because once it happens, now you're in deep stuff. Yeah, if it, if it happens, it's harder to clean up than preventing it from happen to be, happening to begin with. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I wanted to add one more thing. To, uh, when you were talking about sure. um, your cell phone and your screen lock, mm -hmm. um, you can set the, the, um, the time on when that actually locks. Some people, you know, set it to like a minute or so, but you can set it a lot sooner. Um, recommend sooner than later. Okay, so a quick lock on the phone. So, so if your phone does get stolen, they don't have time to get access to the information while it's still on the unlock phase. Okay, thank you for, thank you for bringing that up. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for such a wonderful and entertaining presentation. Thank you. Uh, what is your opinion about third parties, web pages that offer protection against password? One of those is Norton. You can just log into it, put all your passwords, they will have it in the cloud, right. and then uh, they can use it with a single password that 
you can use for any other site you want. Uh, is so that secure? Is not? Yeah, what, what I, what I, I'm, I'm in favor of it, and I use the one called Keeper, which I describe because it's on my phone, and I'm, I'm more uh, on my phone than I am on my computer. And I, I, I'm in favor of using that because the alternative to using something like that is, is you're, 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 you're not using different passwords to make it easy for yourself, or you're writing them down on a piece of paper or in a Word file. So using that is much more secure. It's encrypted. Norton protects it. If someone gets access to Norton's system, yeah, they have access to passwords, but can they use those in all your accounts? You probably won't be able to implement that very quickly before they realize the breach. So I think you're, you're safe to use something like that. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hold on one second. Okay, when you freeze your credit, do yeah. you just go to annualcreditcard.com? Yeah. Do you have to freeze it in Experian, uh, all three no. places? Fantastic question. No, you don't have to. You, you actually don't do it at annualcreditreport.com. You go online and Google Credit Freeze Ohio. It'll bring you to the right place. Credit Freeze Ohio, and you could freeze one, two, or three, all of your reports. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to do all three. You can do them individually if you want to. And to be, if you're going to freeze it, you might as well freeze all three. There's one over here. The reason why I say that, ma'am, too, let's say you want to get a credit card uh, or a new, uh, phone, a new phone, they do a credit check, ask them what company they use to do the credit check, and you could selectively unfreeze that one only, and it's a little bit easier than unfreezing all three. Yeah, that's why I say you can do it individually. Wait, I'll get back to you in a second. Yes? When you get the telephone call yeah. telling you you're in arrears for your IRS, and please send money and so forth, you don't do it, but can, is there some place you right. can report it to? Another great question. You know, those type of phone calls are, so, are, are, are in epidemic proportions right now, and you could call uh, the FBI office, and they're probably not going to do much about it. They may take a report. They'll probably just tell you that, that just as long as you weren't victimized, they're really not going to do anything about it. Police probably aren't going to take a report even. There is a place you can go online. It's called ic3.gov. This is on your handout, a way to report Internet-related crimes. Now, I know that's a phone call, but you can still report it through that site, too. And they take, they, it's a clearinghouse for all types of fraud, and then they put out regular alerts about what people are receiving, ic3.gov, because you call somebody and they're probably not going to be taking the time to, to take a report on something like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. My home insurance company uh, says, actually, I bought it, it was for $25 a year, we will pay to get you out of any identity fraud uh, problems. It made me think, well, gee, how serious a problem can that be if they're willing to uh, you know, protect me for the, such a low amount? Well, let me answer that question by just backing up a little bit. People often ask me about identity theft monitoring, like LifeLock, who also say they'll get you out of, they'll help you unwind from a problem involving identity theft. I'm not sure how easily they can do that because they don't have the power of attorney to do those things and talk to your, these organizations. And uh, probably you're paying too much for something like LifeLock. However, home insurance companies like Nationwide and others do offer that service at a very reduced rate, and I think uh, I, I, would, I would use it if you have an agent that offers that at, at a low price like $25. Now, the better thing that they do, though, is monitor your credit. So if you get, a, if you get someone tries to steal your identity and open a credit card account, you'll get notified by that insurance company. So that's really the important part. And then afterwards, you're not going to be a victim to begin with at, at all. So then they don't have to worry about cleaning up and doing things later which is probably why they're offering it at a lower rate. Uh, I think we have them back here, this one right here. Uh, simple question. Can you get a new Social Security number? You can get a new Social Security number, but I don't recommend it because your Social Security number is a new Social Security number is always tied to your old Social Security number. So even if you've had fraud and you're trying to get rid of that social to get that fraud out of your background, uh, it's still, they're still going to say, well, this guy got a new social in 2015. What was his old social? And then they're going to record the old, they'll look back at the old social, and there's still going to be fraud there. Okay, so I don't think it's worth getting a new social. Yes? Right. Right. Carol asks a great question. She says, when you go to a doctor or someone other than a doctor or a dentist, and they want your social security number or they won't treat you. You know, I, I usually tell them at a, at, at a doctor's office, I just got asked this the other day, I usually say, do you really need my social? And they say, no, we have a nine digit of space in our computer, we have to put a number in there and your social is the one we use because that's your unique identifier. I said, well, I don't know if I want to give you that. They said, well, I'll fill it in with all zeros or all nines so we can fill up the space. You might want to ask them if they'll do that. 
uh, because they, they don't, I don't know how safe they really protect, how, how secure those social security numbers are. So see if you can do that without giving them a social. If your social is part of your health insurance, like your, your, your Medicare card, then they have it anyway. Um, so it's not, it's not going to be a big deal because they already have it. But for new places, when they ask you that, you know, use another alternative if you can. We have one, uh, okay, one way in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah, I come from the camp that despite what an individual does in terms of personal security, uh, in terms of the internet or whatever, that in the end we don't control the information. There's information that there's third parties. There's just so many things that we don't control, right? The donut shop that, that has our credit card information, et cetera, right? So my question really is geared, you, when your information goes out, it's out on the web. It's never gonna be retracted. No matter, despite what you do, it's there. It's forever. And eventually hackers will get smart and they'll pull all the information that's coming from, you know, where they've hacked various sources. So the question I have is, is the government doing anything, for example, to change how they identify individuals, right? We have the social security number. But once your social security number's out there, it's out there right. and forever. And so we, we, we've got a system that's out there that is dependent upon identifying people with social. So are they doing anything to change the way they identify people? And then the second question is, is there any special projects going on to change the way the internet is designed? Because it was fundamentally based on you know, universities to, to communicate. And then we built all these systems on top of it. So it's really not structured for the things that we do today. So is the government doing anything to change the way this whole thing operates? Well, let's start with the social, then I'll get to the next question. The social has become a problem. It was only meant, when the social was established in the 1930s, it was meant to be c connected to our social security, our government retirement pension. And then all of a sudden people realize, this is a unique number, some names are the same, so we can't discriminate or, or, or tell two different people if they got the same name, so let's use social to do that. And so that's how it evolved, is having social security numbers used for a lot of different things. And then Crooks figured out how to use them for identity theft purposes. All right. Now, if you go to the FTC website, they talk about how to keep yourself safe from identity theft. Never write your social security number on a check. You go to the IRS website, and they tell you when you pay your taxes, write your social security number on your check. So it's, it's stuff like that. I know what you're saying. The answer is uh, they're not doing anything to change it to make the social less valuable for identity thieves. All right. And in terms of the Internet itself, you're right. It was built with openness in mind to communicate with other people. There was no issues with security. When Microsoft Internet Explorer was built, the first version, it was just open. You know, we, this is for a good reason. We're communicating with people. And now they realize the bad guys are taking advantage of that. How, what's the government doing? If they're doing something in secret, I, I don't know about it. But I think it's just an evolving way we have to start changing the way we behave and also you know, fortifying these, these ranks. And, and the government, not only the government, but businesses have to get together to prevent it themselves from being victimized. And they need to talk about what the, the, hack, the hacking is, how it's done, and try to take steps to keep themselves safe. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's businesses and the government. Yes. You would suggest not putting the yes. social security number on there? Yeah, because your check, think about where your check goes. It goes through your banking I know, system. I know, About That's six people me. probably look at your check. I would never write my social on a check because so many people are going to be looking at that along the way. Sure. The IRS, the only reason why I want that on there is because that ties you to a tax return. They may, it may get disconnected uh, and then they, they can know who it belongs to. But if they lose my check, so I write them another check. Don't put the social on the check. Do you think the new iPhones with fingerprint identification is helpful? And if so, are we going to go to retina things too, hopefully? Retina because is something they've always talked about. I think the mm -hmm. iPhone fingerprint's a good thing, the only because it may, it's easier for us, people who wouldn't otherwise use a password because it's too inconvenient to put a password in, put the fingerprint on it, and it's easier, and it, and it unlocks the system with the fingerprint. Right. So I think f it, it, to the extent that it makes people use it, use the security, I, I think that's better, and I think that's good. Now, in terms of retinal scans, I don't, I don't think the, the technology is probably there, but it hasn't been implemented yet, on, on certainly not on phones and on other places, too. So that may be coming in the future. But they took it when, when I went into Japan. They take your eyeball scan and right. your fingerprint. And they do use it for uh, entry into this country, too, because they use it for the uh, processing of, of uh, on, your, on, your, on your passport, not your passport, but the, uh, the global entry system that I use when I travel. They take a retinal scan. So it can be used, it's just not Why widely, can't we catch used. these people that are coming into the country? 
incognito. That's well. That's, Can't that's we do the eyeball scans and the fingerprint? I think they should probably do I that. They don't, they don't always. They don't always do that. And it's probably a, the technology's there. We haven't caught up with it. We haven't used it yet. Yes, ma'am. With the new iPhone, paying by your iPhone. Right. Apple Pay. Apple Pay was introduced on Monday this week, and uh, I plan on installing it on my phone. And the reason why it's more secure than credit cards is because, you, first of all, it doesn't keep the credit card number on your phone. It's only a token that then establishes a connection where they can load your credit card from another location and do the charges. So, and you still get your points, you still get your miles, but the credit card number is not on your phone. And if, someone, if a bad guy crook stole your phone, he doesn't have access to the credit card numbers, even if he could get into the app, because you have your phone, your phone protected with the fingerprint or the password. It's not in there. So think of it a day where we don't even have to carry, and I'm not plugging Apple here, believe me, they've had problems with iCloud and all that, but I think the iPay is a good thing because now I don't have to carry around these credit cards. If I lose this, all my credit cards are gone. They could be used. I, use my, I don't have these anymore to carry around. It's all on my phone. I lose my phone, they still can't use the credit cards because the numbers aren't on there, but I can still use it for payment. We've got time for one more, Dave, it's Dave says. One more question. And then I'll, be, I'll stick around after, too. If anybody wants to come up and ask questions, I'll be here. I got nowhere to go. <laughs> to back to my hotel room. You know. I'll hang out. What are your thoughts concerning the app that stores uh, usernames and passwords? Okay, so um, I, the one I use is on my phone, and then the one on the computer that I mentioned was Dashlane or LastPass or KeePass. Um, the app on the phone, Keeper, and, and I can tell you it's, it's really very beneficial to me because I have, I don't just have three passwords because I, ha you know, I have all these accounts. If I'm here in Cincinnati and I need to change my flight on Delta tomorrow because something happened, I, I don't know my Delta password and I'm not going to carry around a piece of paper and it's not the same as all my other passwords because Delta has the 10 digit password and the other ones have different, so I have it on my phone. Keeper is a great app. I think it's uh, safe to keep it on my phone. And again, it's protected with two layers of security. They got to get on my phone. They got a password to get into the app. So, yeah, I think it's secure. So the Keeper is not on the. Uh, it's not on the internet. It's on your 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 device. It's on Keeper is uh, is an app that works on your phone on your smartphone. It also backs up in the cloud, and it's also on your computer and backed up on there. Encrypted, of course, and it's encrypted in the cloud, which was someone was asking about, which is important too. So if someone gets access to the cloud, the information's encrypted. Now, is anything 100% secure? No, but again, it's better than carrying around, uh, not having my passwords with me and, and not being able to get access to my accounts, having to reset my passwords or carrying them around on a piece of paper or in a Word file that's not encrypted. Okay, listen, my wife Pam is here with me and she will be offering my book. We don't have any copies here except one to look at, but uh, we, she will take orders from you. We can mail it to you. If you're interested, she'll be over in that corner. But otherwise, I want to first of all thank Foster and Motley for, bring, for bringing me here. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me come here. And I want to thank you for coming and spending time with me tonight to talk about this important topic. And uh, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time talking to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.